Welcome back everybody to another episode of Direct Comparison. In today's episode, we're going to take a look at Ubisoft's recently released open world adventure game Immortals Phoenix Rising, and see how it compares both visually and from a gameplay perspective to Nintendo's groundbreaking Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Now, before we begin, bear in mind that Breath of the Wild was released over three years ago, and was originally intended as a Wii U exclusive title. Because of this, we should fully expect a AAA title released by Ubisoft in 2020 that has been tailor-made for more powerful hardware to deliver a superior visual presentation, at least from a technical perspective. Therefore, the goal for this particular video is not necessarily to determine which game looks better, but rather to demonstrate what exactly these two developers have done differently, and how Ubisoft has adopted Breath of the Wild's popular style and gameplay design to benefit their own vision. For this video, both games are being recorded on the platform that delivers the highest possible fidelity. So, Breath of the Wild is being played on the Nintendo Switch, while Immortals is being played and recorded on the PC, with all of its settings cranked up as high as possible at a native 4K resolution. There is technically a way to get Breath of the Wild running via an emulation at a higher resolution and frame rate, but because that's not an official method for playing the game, we're going to stick with the Switch version instead. Alright, so let's kick this comparison off by first taking a brief look at the presentation, starting with the character models. So right away, we can begin to break apart some fairly obvious artistic differences between the design of these lead protagonists. In Phoenix Rising, Ubisoft opted for a semi-realistic approach, with character facial models that, while still stylized, resemble how humans would appear in real life. The skin is textured, Shadowing is complex enough to properly identify the contours of the facial structure, and the eyes, while a bit large for an average human, offer some nice reflective properties, giving them some real depth. Link from Breath of the Wild is much more heavily stylized. The face proportions are greatly exaggerated, with gigantic pupils relative to the size of his nose and mouth, and there's pretty much no identifiable texture maps at all, just flat shades of individual colors for each major feature. This gives Link a significantly more animated appearance, like a controllable cartoon character, and while it's not as technically advanced as what we see in Phoenix Rising, it works perfectly in the confines of Breath of the Wild's unique art direction, which is benefited even further with its cell-shaded post-processing effect. These same observations can be made with other characters throughout the game, with a clearly more stylistic approach to the design of things like horses, while Phoenix Rising features a bit more fine detail in each of its character designs. Next up, let's talk about the environments. From the moment the overall scope of the open world was revealed in my playthrough of Immortals, I immediately noticed some pretty blatantly obvious parallels between it and the Kingdom of Hyrule. Both worlds stretch exceptionally far, with some extreme draw distances, and lots of unique and interesting landmarks to explore. What's more, they both feature a large central structure, encased in a mysterious evil fog, that serves as a constant reminder of the player's ultimate goal. However, aside from that and the many optional puzzle dungeons hidden all around, that's where the similarities end. The Golden Isle is really nothing like the Kingdom of Hyrule, for several important reasons. For one, the Golden Isle is significantly smaller in its overall scale. You can make it across the entire map within a good 10-15 to 15 minutes, depending on the route you take. And while there's certainly some obstacles along the way to prevent you from getting too far early on, they're generally pretty easy to circumvent. Hyrule, on the other hand, is immense. Attempting to cross it on foot will take a significant amount of time, and there's a lot of areas that are simply impossible to bypass at first. Either because you'll run into obstacles too high to climb, or you won't have the right outfits to survive the varied environmental conditions. But even if you were to shrink down all the mountains and brush aside the various obstacles along the way, Hyrule's landmass is still huge when compared to the Golden Isle, with valleys that stretch for miles and plenty of room to just take in the scenery. You could argue that a lot of areas in Breath of the Wild feel empty, which is certainly true. But paired with its peaceful atmosphere and accompanying musical score, it works perfectly within the confines of the game's intended art direction. To make up for this, Phoenix Rising offers a much more dense and vertical map design. You'll find some open valleys to ride your horse through, but most of the game world is made up of these large, broken up cliffsides and mesas, with lots of old abandoned cities hidden throughout. Another big difference between these two game worlds is the general theme. Breath of the Wild's game world is a hybrid of medieval fantasy and Japanese rural countrysides. There's a lot of incredibly unique locations to explore, all built upon decades of Zelda's ever-expanding lore. 
You'll find large structures like this old church that has a very European influence, but also small villages that harken back to feudal Japan. You'll also run into even more unusual locations, like this treehouse village home to a race of bird people, or this elaborate palace at the mouth of a large river. Phoenix Rising, on the other hand, is inspired entirely by the ancient Greeks, or more specifically, ancient Greek mythology. This game world is designed to be a caricature of Greek society, with greatly exaggerated landmass formations and incredible looking vistas everywhere you look. It's a beautiful looking environment, though it isn't quite as unique or original as the world in Zelda, and the general variety is lacking by comparison. What's even more interesting is the actual quality of the assets that make up these environments. While more advanced structures like the large marble palaces and temples look fantastic, you'll notice that the texture maps applied to surfaces like dirt paths and even underneath patches of grass look much more basic than the texture maps used in Breath of the Wild. It seems to be an inverse of what we discovered with the character models, as Ubisoft decided to use much more simplistic textures to represent the environment in order to preserve their painted aesthetic. This I think works extremely well in favor of Phoenix Rising, as the semi-realistic textures Nintendo used in Breath of the Wild already feel incredibly dated, making surfaces like dirt roads and rock faces feel out of place when juxtaposed to the more stylized grass effects, objects, and character models. Moving on, let's take a look at the lighting. This is another area that differs greatly due to the artistic style used by both of these studios. In Breath of the Wild, the lighting appears very dull and washed out, with a fairly limited color palette that frequently blends together, resulting in a more earthy tone. It was a bit surprising booting this game up after not having touched it since 2017, but after playing a few more hours of it, I began to remember why this lighting design still works remarkably well. The time of day flows so naturally in Breath of the Wild, with believable cloud formations that will actually block out the sun and realistically cast shadows on the valley floor below and grass blowing in the wind will exhibit subtle bloom properties, allowing for this soft glimmer to ripple across the fields. There's even some volumetric god rays that can be seen breaking through the tree canopies in the late evening, which really helps to enhance the scene. Meanwhile, Phoenix Rising offers some much more apparent lighting advantages. Right away, we can see a significantly improved color palette, with rich greens and deep blues that really pop on the screen. It's a gorgeous game, especially when outputting natively on a 4K display. And things like global illumination and volumetric lighting are vastly superior to what's being shown in Zelda. As far as the actual lighting style goes, this really boils down to your personal preference. I for one really like these more cartoony games to showcase lots of vibrant color whenever possible. But Zelda's more subtle touch demonstrates some respectable control. And in combination with the cel-shaded characters, the lighting design can look absolutely beautiful in the right conditions. The shadows are much more cut and dry. One of Breath of the Wild's biggest shortcomings is most definitely the quality of its shadow projections, with lots of jagged edges, pixelation, and a fairly low render distance, causing things like tree shadows to pop into their highest res form right in front of the player. It can be a bit distracting, and the game's 900p max resolution on the Nintendo Switch certainly doesn't help. Shadows in Phoenix Rising, however, look great, with nice soft edges relative to the light source, and some nice use of ambient occlusion to help give textured surfaces more definition. But Phoenix Rising does not project shadows of its environmental clouds like Breath of the Wild does. Then there's the effects. Here we get into another area where there's a lot of artistic style that can be preference based, like explosions and the use of particles. Yes, there's a lot more particle effects and high res explosion effects in every battle in Phoenix Rising but Breath of the Wild's artistic approach gives it its own signature flair that works incredibly well. However, there are a few aspects in each game that really boil down to the technical approach that are worth pointing out. First, there's the grass. The way grass is simulated in both games is absolutely gorgeous, and are major components to each respective game's visual style. The grass in Breath of the Wild is incredibly dense, and even has variable height with the more well-traveled areas having shorter grass, while large abandoned fields like this ancient battlefield have long stretches of tall grass that will gently blow in the wind. Phoenix Rising seems to use mostly the same grass height all throughout, with different colors based on the region, and the way it both blows in the wind and reacts to the player is so subtle that it's barely noticeable. When viewed even closer, the grass barely even moves out of the way of the player, which explains its subtlety and the blades seem to snap back in place, clipping through the player model a bit too quickly. Fire effects are somewhat similar, 
The Fire in Phoenix Rising seems to take the more realistic route, with some high quality flame textures applied to the effect along with some more subtle ember effects. Breath of the Wild, however, is more cartoony, with a really thick red hue surrounding a single flame. But it's the interaction that's really impressive. Unlike Phoenix Rising, the fire in Breath of the Wild features actual physical properties within the game world, meaning it can propagate based on the type of material it's presented with, and it can even melt ice or warm the player in colder locations, keeping it a major step above the more decorative implementation of fire in Phoenix Rising. But while Breath of the Wild seems to feature superior grass and fire simulation, its water simulation leaves a lot to be desired. Like with the ground textures we looked at earlier, Breath of the Wild attempts a slightly more realistic look for its water, with lots of baked in ripple effects based on the body of water that you're viewing. It looks enough like water, but once you try to swim through it or throw an object at it, it feels remarkably flat, as there's practically no interaction with the water surface at all. Phoenix Rising's water is mostly the opposite. Its water surface appears incredibly flat and stylized at first, but there's a significant amount of water interactivity that looks fantastic likely borrowing techniques utilized in the recent Assassin's Creed titles. So overall, at least in regards to the presentation, we get a pretty even matchup. Sure, Breath of the Wild can look bland and dated at first glance, with its earthy color tone, lower resolution, and simplistic character models. But it still features an incredible art direction, along with some really immersive effects. Phoenix Rising, on the other hand, appears cleaner and sharper at almost every turn, with some beautifully vibrant colors and some fantastic environmental designs. But its style feels a little bit less consistent, and it likely won't age quite as well as a more stylized game like Breath of the Wild. But because we're looking at two games from different years and from different platforms, let's turn our attention away from the graphics and instead focus on the parallels in the gameplay design, starting with the general structure. In Breath of the Wild, you wake up in a mysterious looking cave, walk outside, and are given practically no direction to what you're supposed to do. There's a hint here and there, like this cutscene showing a strange old man down the road, but nothing explicitly tells you to interact with him, or even follow the road at all. After a bit of exploration and discovery, the game structure slowly reveals itself, with the player being tasked to visit all four corners of the map, help the people there, and then work together to defeat Calamity Ganon in Castle Hyrule. Phoenix Rising borrows pretty much this exact same premise. The game starts with the lead protagonist waking up mysteriously on a beach this time, and he or she is forced to piece together what's happened, only to learn that the evil Typhon has escaped and has set up shop in the large, easily identifiable structure in the center of the map. But before you can reach him, you need to first travel to the four corners of the game world and rescue the trapped gods there, and with their help attempt to defeat Typhon and save the world. Even the side character, Hermes, serves the same fundamental purpose as the mysterious old man, only instead of text bubbles, he's fully voiced and animated, as are the rest of the characters throughout the game. Then there's the general movement and abilities. This is another area that has helped to generate a lot of early comparisons between Breath of the Wild and Immortals. Phoenix Rising does feel a little bit more refined in this area. The controls feel more precise. And with skill tree upgrades, players can even do unique actions like boosts or dive bombs to enhance these actions further. But Link has a few of his own unique tricks up his sleeve, including magical bombs, telekinesis, or even the ability to create ice pillars in the water. These tools play a huge role in the game's many puzzles, and the world traversal, and are not really replicated at all in Phoenix Rising. You can pick up heavy objects with Heracles Bracers, which looks similar to the carrying animation Link uses. But otherwise, most of the puzzles in Phoenix Rising are tied to pulling switches and manipulating objects like boulders or boxes. For this reason, I think the puzzles may be a bit more interesting in Breath of the Wild, even if they are often shorter and simpler by comparison. What's more, Breath of the Wild also offers hundreds of secret hidden puzzles all throughout the world with incredibly subtle hints like an imbalance of objects or lack of symmetry that almost always leads to the discovery of a Korok seed. There's still plenty of puzzle solving out in the open world of Phoenix Rising, but it's not very subtle at all, at least not to the same degree as Zelda. The inventory management is similarly much simpler in Phoenix Rising. Weapon and armor stats seem to be more universal, with a few passive benefits that should be considered depending on your combat style but you won't be juggling through eight different swords or worrying about any weapon degradation here. 
Breath of the Wild incorporates a far more robust inventory system that includes options for crafting, trade, and durability management. Almost every weapon will degrade with use, requiring players to constantly be on the lookout for replacements, and most environmental objects can be destroyed, dropping useful pickup items that can then be used with food recipes to craft healing items or helpful buffs. And then there's the player upgrades. Player upgrades are actually a little bit simpler in Breath of the Wild. There's two things you can permanently upgrade, your health and your stamina, and both of these stats can be improved by completing the many puzzle shrines hidden throughout the world, and then spending those earned spirit orbs and statues. Phoenix Rising, on the other hand, offers an entire room dedicated to the many different types of player upgrades. You can boost your stamina like in Breath of the Wild by completing puzzle vaults and spending Zeus lightning at Zeus's bench press. But health is handled separately, and requires players to climb up high areas and collect the rare Ambrosia material instead. You can also unlock new player abilities in a skill tree using found coins, and then upgrade your armor and swords using a forge. Then there's the combat design. The combat is much cleaner in Phoenix Rising. Both games feature a similar lock-on melee combat system, with a standard light swing attack and the ability to shoot a bow and arrow from range. But Phoenix Rising also incorporates a secondary heavy attack, that can fill an enemy's stun meter, offering a little bit more complexity to the fights. This is coupled with the parrying ability as well, that can turn the tide of a battle if pulled off properly. Both games also offer a dodge mechanic that will slow down the enemies temporarily when triggered, though instead of the more restrictive flurry rush, Phoenix Rising lets players attack several different enemies within the same slow motion phase, though it doesn't seem to be quite as powerful. But what's really different about Phoenix Rising's design is that things are explained much more clearly. All of this game's mechanics are explained throughout the prologue, as the player is steadily introduced to each weapon and tool with simple obstacles to practice with. And once the game's prologue is completed, there's not really much else to experience. You can learn some new tricks and expand your arsenal, sure, but there's no hidden control combinations or secret cooking recipes that you can discover. It's a very straightforward game, and I think this is the biggest reason why Immortals is not necessarily a Breath of the Wild clone. Breath of the Wild was a fantastic game, not because of its unique visual style or its epic story, but because its world is designed in a way that greatly encourages an unusually large amount of experimentation. No two players' experiences are alike, and there's always an alternative strategy to every obstacle. This is not necessarily the case with Phoenix Rising. Once you've acquired your weapons and learned how to master jumping, flying, and sprinting, the gameplay stays pretty consistent all the way through, with no need to worry about what the environmental conditions are or what time of day it is. It plays things a lot more safely, and the result is a world that feels less alive. Finally, let's wrap up with a brief sound comparison. Which game do you think offers the superior audio quality?
And that wraps up this episode of Direct Comparison. Overall, I think it's pretty clear where these two games stand. Breath of the Wild may not have aged particularly well in regards to its muddy textures, low frame rates, and resolution, but its beautiful cel-shaded art style and unprecedented attention to detail in regards to its environmental interactivity still remains unmatched. Phoenix Rising is no doubt greatly inspired by the success of Breath of the Wild, among other open world games like Assassin's Creed Odyssey, but its more colorful presentation, more polished control scheme, and over-reliance on humor aren't enough to hide the relatively shallow gameplay experience on offer. Now, don't get me wrong, I've loved playing through Immortals. It's a solid game in its own right. The combat feels great, and the puzzles are a lot of fun to solve. But if the goal was to recreate the success of Breath of the Wild, Immortals is a long way off from sharing the same level of immersion offered by Nintendo's breakaway hit. But because a lot of this really boils down to player preference, what do you guys think? Which game do you think looks better? And which game do you think plays better? Let me know in the comments section. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe for continued coverage of the latest next-gen content posted every week.